All right, can online hear me? Yes, thank you. We you keep checking that to make sure. <laughs> okay, sorry, we're not very tech savvy right here. Okay, so first I'm going to just go ahead and introduce our field team. Um, so we have everyone stand up. So our <laughs> new and director of academic advising and field education is Patrice Green. A lot of y'all might know her. I'm going to do one thing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Like Natalie said, I am so glad that you guys all came. And for those of that are online, I'm so thankful that you guys took the time out of your day to join us. We've got a lot of great information for you. Um, if you all need me, you guys should have my information as well. I'm pretty sure I've worked with some of you because of being a field liaison. Um, I've had interaction with quite a few people as well. So thanks and welcome. And then um, I'm Natalie. Let's show you again, Natalie Mayhem. Chris Clark is our field coordinator. He is um, going to be here a little bit later. So a lot of y'all may have talked with him recently. He's pretty much our go-to in place person. So um, he also <laughs> works in uh, he also works installation agreements along with Amanda Land, our administrative assistant that was just talking. Um, and then Chris also does attestation letters for any of the locations that need attestation letters for our students. The next is our new new title. Um, you probably know we've always referred to our academic advisors in the field office as field advisors. We have recently gotten the approval to change the name, so they are now field education specialists. So y'all will start hearing that name. I think this will help because a lot of students get the field advisors confused with academic advisors. Um, we do two totally different things, but students get confused, so we decided to change the name. So now they are field education specialists. So first up, we have Andrea Jamison. She works with our MSW Foundation students. Those are typically students that are coming into the master's program without a BSW, or that may have gotten their BSW more than like 10 years ago. <laughs> so um, they have to come in as an MSW Foundation student. So, um, they, it's basically just a generalist kind of placement. Um, then next we have Sharon Martin. <laughs> she um, has recently switched to being the um, field education specialist. I got to be saying that um, for advanced mental health. Um, then we have Monica Brown. Monica right now is being an extra help. We are down one an education specialist. So um, she has temporarily took on a couple of extra categories. So good job for her. <laughs> it's been very helpful. Um, she has advanced, normally she will have advanced children and families. Um, and then she also right now is doing advanced health, aging, and cap. Those are typically our three smallest groups, but it's great that Monica can step in and do that. Um, then our newest field education specialist is Vanessa Carvio. Um, she's been here two months? No, less than that. Yeah, <laughs> not very long. But she has just jumped in and done a great job. Um, she is now over our BSW students in our um, Bachelor's of Science and Substance Use um, students. So I don't know if y'all a lot of, of y'all know about the new degree that we have, but but that's what we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So what we usually like to start this off with is for you to think back about what it was like when you were an MSW student um, or a BSW student. Um, so that's kind of, I think, what a lot of us that have been privileged enough to be able to be a field instructor in the field, I think it's really good for when you are instructing students coming in to reflect on not just what your experience was, but how maybe you would have wanted things to be differently for you. So that's kind of something to think about when you're doing um, field instruction. How was the best way you learned? You can always do that, but please, you know, talk with the students. How is the best way you learn? Because it may be different the way you learn. So I think just keep open to that. Um, I think a lot of times I know field instructors, sometimes you're able to see the students very regularly, maybe every day, 
sometimes you are a field instructor for students, you may just meet with, you know, that one time a week. So I think whichever way it is, if you can just develop that relationship, you know, make sure that they feel comfortable with you, um, you know, just help them feel welcomed. Um, just kind of think about, like I said, when you were a student, how you would have wanted to, to have a field instructor. Um, this is a good question too. Think about what was your most impactful learning experience, because that may be something you could translate to, you know, showing students as a field instructor. Um, and I think that's a great question too. How does the field instruction that you got when you were an intern, how has that affected your career now? Um, so it's just something to think about. You know, you may only be in the student's life for a semester or two, but it's just like your teachers from the past. You, you know, you can always influence students throughout their career. So we will go a little bit more over this later. We have a pretty fun activity <laughs> planned for the very end. Um, so we will go more over the core competencies, but these are just the basic core competencies that you will see. Um, of course, they are um, a little different for each specialty. Um, basically, BSW and, and MSW foundations, their learning contract that they have, the core competencies are exactly the same. This is just a generalist macro micro plus placement. Where you will see the biggest difference is with the five different specialties we have. Um, I think, yeah, Vanessa's going to talk about the different specialties that we have in just a little bit. Um, but these are just some of the core competencies. Um, so this would be great. Um, this, like I said, we're going to go over this later. We have a little learning contract workshop we're going to go over, y'all. And so if you'll have any questions about the competencies or if you're having trouble coming up with tasks for those competencies, we're definitely just going to gotta work on those together. And... Now, I will let Vanessa take it. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Happy it's Friday, right? So I'm going to go over our student categories that we have um, to start with. We have the BSW, and like Natalie was saying, it's a generalist um, practicum. So their placement is going to um, consist of 480 hours and they have two options in how to complete those 480 hours okay the first one is a block placement so they have to complete the 480 hours in one semester so for example if they're doing it in the summer that's about 35 hours per week if they're doing it in fall or spring semesters that's 32 hours per week okay the second option is a split placement that would consist of 240 hours over two semesters so for summer students, they're looking about 24 hours a week and in the fall semester around like 18 to 20 hours a week, okay? The newest program I have here at the School of Social Work is called the BSSUT, the Bachelor's in Science and Substance Use Treatment. They will also need to do 480 hours with an agency that um, treats substance use disorders or core core mental health substance use disorders. Typically with these students, um, they also need an LCDC because once they graduate, they will be able to um, obtain their license through their coursework since they are doing coursework related to substance use and they are doing their practicum in substance use, okay? And they also have the option of either doing the block or split semester. Next is our MSW Foundation. Um, this is for students, like Nali was saying, that do not have an um, undergrad degree in social work or have been 10 or more years since they obtained their BSW. And again, this is going to be um, a generalist practicum that they're looking for. Again, they have the 480 hours that they have to complete, the block 480 in one semester, or two consecutive semesters of 240 hours. Next, we have our advanced MSW um, degrees. These are the students who have a bachelor's in social work. So they automatically go into their advanced year. They also need to complete 480 um, hours one semester or split 240, okay? And these are um, aging, cap, mental health students. So I am going to take you to our Office of Field Education website. I don't know if any of you would like to use a QR code and save this link because it has really important information for you guys to look at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you might want to bookmark this and keep this and 
even add it to your, your office computer because it's going to um, have a lot of great resources for you. <laughs> so here's what the page is going to look like, and it's just going to give um, a general information about the field office, um, what students need to do for prepare for field. Um, it's going to have our contact information, um, Natalie's, Amanda's, all of ours, if you need to get in touch with us. It has um, our emails that you're able to access. And it has some really great, um, we're continuously updating this page. We are working on it right now. We have um, like facts and cues for field instructors and students, um, how they apply for placement, um, about the hours. We also, this one is really great. This is our calendar. So for the field instructors, it's going to show when the agency request opens, the first day of class, when the learning contracts are due, when the midterm evaluations are due for the liaisons as well, and when the last day of classes, right? So we have, so you're able to see when the semester starts and when it ends. So that way you can, we can assist the students be mindful of their hours in their practicum, okay? Um, right here, again, on the contact us, it has all of our information with emails. Um, you can send an email to any of us, Christopher Clark, he helps a lot with in place, any issues you have um, as far as affiliation agreements as, as well with Ms. Amanda Lang. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Andrea. I met some of y'all in the crowd earlier. I'm going to go back into Firefox. Go back into Firefox. Mm -hmm. And then pull it on the top menu. Where is it? There it is. Here we are. OK. I'm going to do the prevent from the current slide. Is that yes. OK? <laughs> Okay, field instructors. Yay, my favorite people. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Andrea Jameson. I'm one of the field advisors. Uh, I work with all of the MSW Foundation students, um, but I was also a field instructor in a previous job. So um, this is why I do this work. I absolutely love working with students, and I think field instruction instruction is one of the most important things. I mean, it is. It's the most important part of this thing. Isn't really sitting on my head. <laughs> um, yeah, we need our field instructors in order to graduate our students. So thank y'all so much for being here. Um, I know you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart. You're not doing it for the CEUs. We're advocating to change that policy in the Texas legislature so you can get your CEUs again. Okay, so what I'm going to talk with y'all about today is kind of the required qualifications of what's what's expected for um, being in this role. Um, roles and responsibilities of all of the people that are involved in our students' internships. Lots of terminology. Um, Kind of going over the agency environment, kind of how to prepare students for the for the field, and then last but not least, some unsolicited advice from me. Um, okay, so first I'm going to kind of um, go over these these roles and responsibilities, so it's, it's clear who is doing what. Okay, so the first the first thing I want y'all to think about is who is managing the student. Okay, so we we typically divide that into task supervisors and field instructors. Um, and granted, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know a lot of you guys have been doing this work for a while. Um, so this will be a fun review for you. Um, okay, so task supervisors um, are typically the, the people who are going to work day to day with your student. This is the person that your student might see the most, might be shadowing on a daily basis. Um, they assign specific tasks for your intern to work on. Don't have to be a social worker. Um, and they can also participate in the midterm calls, the evaluations, but it's not required. Um, field instructors, however, that is you guys. That is the agency point of contact, master's level social worker. Um, I know y'all have heard from us multiple times as we're doing outreach for agencies saying, all right, all right, student, if you're especially out of area, you're looking for your own placement, you got to make sure that your field instructor is an MSW, has the two years of postgraduate work experience. Um, so if you just graduated in 2022, I'm sorry, I'm, I know you have your MSW, but you can't be a field instructor just yet, but you can be a task supervisor. 
Um, and I will say task supervisors and field instructors can be the same person. I know a lot of us are working in smaller agencies, so a lot of times that's that's the one social worker in the, in the agency. Um, the field instructor is responsible for meeting with your student at least one hour a week for supervision. Um, and I think like either Natalie or um, Vanessa said, the number of weeks in the semester will change. Okay, so summer is shorter. It's about like 11 weeks. Uh, fall and spring are gonna be more like 15, 16 weeks. Um, but yeah, the CSWE, sorry, Council on Social Work Education requirement is that you meet for the student once a week. Um, if there's ever a time when you, you know, have to take a mental health day or you're on vacation or you're not gonna be there that day, Totally fine. You can make up that time with your student or just let the, um, the your student's professor know like, hey, you know, I couldn't make it this day. We'll make a note in the, the supervision notes and we'll waive it. That's fine. But try to do your best to meet with your student at least once a week. If not more. Um, you're also going to help your student with their learning contract, which we will go over in an exercise in a minute. Um, your role is also to keep keep the student accountable to their learning. So when you do their learning contract, basically what that is is an educational agreement to kind of set up set up their goals. It's really putting structure to the work. Um, so making sure they have activities in all nine social work uh, competencies. We'll go over that again. Um, you're also going to sign off on the time and supervision logs in in place, and you're also going to conduct the midterm call with the student and their professor as well as the evaluation at the end of the semester. So lots of things. Um, oh, okay. Now we're going to uh, talk about kind of the roles of your UTA contacts. Okay, so your field liaison, aka your student's field class professor. Um, this is the person. Okay, so with how our classes work, and you all know this because you all have your MSW, you went through this yourself. Um, with your internship, you also have a field class that gives structure to the internship. That's where you get your grade. Our students are doing um, writing assignments. They're doing their evaluations. All that is online, um, and it's headed up by your students' uh, field liaison, aka field professor. Um, this can be the same person as your field education specialist, your field advisors. <laughs> We're all wearing multiple hats, which is why I wear the hat. Um, this is me toning it down. You guys, usually I have like a giant wig or a hat. Anyway, got to keep it fun in this job. Um, but yeah, can be the same person as your advisor. Um, and your field liaison, the professor, your student's professor is going to be the primary point of contact if you have issues with your student. So if there's any issues, maybe I don't know, maybe they're not attending, they're not coming to the internship, they are exhibiting maybe maybe some unprofessional behavior, or if you have any concerns in general, or they're amazing, if you have an amazing intern, that's going to be more often the case. Um, definitely want you to, to reach out to the student's field professor. Um, the, 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 the role of, of the field liaison is, is truly to be a liaison between the student and the agency, so between the school and the agency. So, um, so yeah, definitely contact the, the student uh, professor first. Um, and then talking a little bit more about us, field education specialists, AKA field advisors, this is your initial contact for placement. Okay, so that is the biggest um, piece of our, of our multifaceted job. Um, so once a student has been placed in their internship, um, like you'll get a lot of contact from us when we're searching for internships, we're placing students, um, we're figuring out who's the professor of their field class, we'll assign them, and then once your student has started their hours with you in your agency, there's really very little need that you would need to reach out to us again. Um, not to say we don't want to hear from you because we love you guys and we want to, um, but it's going to be probably quicker and more efficient um, to get your issues resolved if you contact the professor. Um, so make sure that y'all get linked as soon as your student starts their internship. So. Another big part of our role is we are <clears throat> advisors for students entering fields. So even before they start their internship, uh, the whole semester before, even a few semesters before they even start, we have some really eager students. Um, they contact us. Oh, I'm sorry. They contact us and we coach them through what to expect in fields. Um, that's kind of what I, so pretend I have a baseball cap on. <laughs> that's what I kind of consider our role is that we are here to coach students 
or like guidance counselors for, for graduate students. Um, but yeah, what else, other things that we do among, among many, um, we approve the field applications. So students all have to apply for field before we can allow them to, to enter a field placement. Um, we approve the place of employment requests. So if any of you, if, if any of y'all have agencies in which um, students are already working in a social services role, fun fact, the Council on Social Work Education last year permitted a kind of a temporary COVID provision to stay permanent, which is if somebody is working in kind of an entry level social work role, they can use that as their internship. So that's a great way for a lot of our students who are working full time, who need um, who need to kind of dub, you know may maximize their time. Anybody have people doing place of employment, or have you ever worked with students doing that before? Okay, cool. Um, so more info information on that if you have interest. Um, we also assign the field placements, and then if, if applicable, we'll assign grades because we're also serving as liaisons. So. For a lot of y'all, we will be kind of filling those dual roles, but just reach out if there's any issues. Okay, requirements for field instructors. Okay, so for all field instructors, no matter who your student is, we need your resume, you need two years of postgraduate work experience, and most importantly, have the capacity, time, and willingness to teach future social workers slash service providers. There's no question that that's that you guys are all here for the right reasons. You're all here because you want to invest in, in the lives of future social workers um, and substance abuse service providers. <laughs> it's a new degree, so I have to remind myself to say that. Um, yeah, but just making sure, you know, this is a commitment. It's I would say on average, it's about like two hours a week. You know, you're doing a you're doing a one hour a week supervising your student, you're approving hours, you're working on their evaluations, you're investing time with your students. So it is definitely a commitment. And I just want to thank y'all for your sacrifice because I know this is you're, you're doing this for free. Um, OK, so if requirements for the different degrees for BSW students, you have to have either a BSW or an MSW from a Council on Social Work Education accredited university. Um, for for uh, the Bachelor of Science in Substance <coughs> use and treatment. <laughs> BSSUT students must have an LCDC, so licensed chemical dependency counselor. Um, and a social work degree is preferred but not required. So that's why it's a little hard to remember kind of the requirements. Um, for MSW students, you have to have an MSW, LMSW, or an LCSW from a CSW accredited over uh, university. So you don't have to be licensed. So if anybody in here has an NSW but isn't licensed, that's okay. We won't judge. It's all good. We are trying to kind of, um, or we are I mean, just to let y'all know, we are trying to kind of um, encourage students to consider licensure when they're done graduating. That's not something that's really baked into our curriculum just yet. Um, but yeah, um, doesn't matter if you have a license or not. It is okay. Um, okay, key responsibilities. So we already kind of talked about a, a lot of these. Meet one hour a week for supervision. Develop and implement orientation for students. Make sure your students are trained, y'all. I know it can be sometimes really easy to just be like, all right, just throwing you in the mix. We're, we're going fast and furious in this agency, but make sure they have, um, you know, enough time and space to kind of process what does this agency do? What is my role? And um, what are the expectations for me as an intern? Um, facilitate directed learning opportunities and skill building related to the learning contract. So I like to consider the learning contract kind of as a living document, as like a guide for how we want to structure their learning. So I know when you do the, the learning contract, it's like a static document in, in place, but I like to think of it as, okay, how do, how do we keep our students accountable for, they don't have to be masters in every single category, but how do we make sure that they have some activity in every single competency? Even if your agency is more micro-focused, more macro-focused, or more anything else specifically focused, it's really important that you give um, learning opportunities in those other areas. If you need help with that, definitely let us know. Talk to your student's professor and we can help you um, create those learning opportunities. Um, be present and available to students. Um, one of the worst things when students start, if they, you know, if they're like, oh, my field instructor is too busy to meet with me. I really need, um, you know, my supervision. 
Um, I know that doesn't happen with anybody in this room, but um, yeah, just just make yourself make yourself available. We know that um, especially new students who maybe this is their first year, they might um, have a lot of questions, but that's totally okay. Again, what Natalie said, remember when you were an intern, how maybe awkward you felt. I know I felt awkward. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, and it's just provide an opportunity that's welcoming so that they feel comfortable asking you questions. Serve as a role model for students. Okay, so no pressure, but your student is going to be watching your every move. So not saying you have to be perfect. None of us are perfect, but just do your best to, to remember, be mindful of, okay, my student is watching how I interact with clients, with coworkers, how I'm taking care of myself, how I structure my time. So just things to, to be mindful of. Um, and we also expect you to assess the student for suitability for the profession. So one of maybe the harder things about this, about um, being in, in the social work education space is when we have to counsel students out of, the from out of the profession. If maybe they're not cut out for this work, maybe they've got a lot going on and they're just not, um, they just don't have the capacity to, to take on the heavy, the heavy trauma of a lot of, a lot of the clients that we serve. Um, you know, all those things are very legit and your role as a gatekeeper is really important here. So we're, we're all gatekeepers from the university, but also you guys are an extension of, of the university staff. So if you, if you ever have concerns about, I don't know if this is the right profession for you, um, you're having concerns about your students' um, ability to use healthy coping skills when they're dealing with full-time work, family, school, internship, life, it's hard. It's a big, it's a very big balance, um, but it's really important for them to be able to demonstrate resilience um, and perseverance through, through some of these hard obstacles so they can be successful in, in the field. Um, also important to help students see all the com complexities involving clients. Um, as you know, I mean, our profession is all about being holistic and, and wrapping around and thinking of person environment and, you know, thinking about all the different scenarios that could be going on with a client. Um, help them see another perspective. If they're, if they're really, if you're, if you're noticing that they're um, kind of really stuck in one, one mode of thought, just challenge them. Challenge them with another perspective. Um, we also expect you to evaluate students' progress and development, um, helping them keep track of their goals. Um, verify documentation of supervision, corrective action, hours, evaluation. Okay, one thing I will say about hours. This is what I tell students all the time. I say, make sure you log your hour, hours at least once a week, if not every day, if you want, but keep up with it every week so that you're not, you know, mid semester and you're like, I haven't put in any of my hours. Oh no, I don't know if I'm behind or not. I would challenge all with the same, the same thing. So if we're asking students to input their hours every week, I ask you guys to also approve your, approve their hours. It doesn't have to be every week. You can wait till the end of the semester if you want to. But just to kind of keep those layers of accountability there, um, and just so you know, kind of where you're at, where your student is at, hours-wise, um, around the midterm, so the midpoint of the semester, we just did them in March. Um, students should be about halfway through their hours requirement. Um, but yeah, just kind of keep an eye on that because it is the worst when students get at the end of the semester and they're like, "Oh my God, I have a hundred more hours to do," and it's like, "How did this happen?" So just um, help us help the student uh, keep on keep um, keep their hours in order. Okay, communicate communicate with the field liaison, aka your student's field professor. That's really really important um, to ensure that the student has a wraparound support team in their internship. They're not out there on their own, um, and especially if there are issues, definitely let the field professor know. And of course, monitor the holistic growth and development of the student. Um, really important to not just not just kind of model model appropriate behaviors in the professional setting, but also just as a human being who's dealing with the trauma, complex trauma of clients, dealing with our own really busy lives or really busy jobs. Um, and it's just important to check in. Like, how are you doing? How are you doing processing this stuff? You know, how are you feeling when you experience working with a client? dealing with X, Y, Z for the first time in your life. Sometimes that can be a real, um, you know, I know all of us have been in the field forever. We're veterans. We've, we've learned how to cope with some of that stuff, but these students are new. They're new to figuring out time management. 
They're new to figuring out how their body reacts to different, different client trauma. Um, their own trauma is going to come up. Um, so if there's any issues that you're noticing with students feeling overwhelmed, anxious, they might be a little reserved, a little, you know, uh, maybe nervous to talk to you about it. And it might be hard for them to admit to themselves that they're struggling with some of the material. So just proactively just ask them how they're doing, how they're handling, um, and celebrate their successes. Okay. Thinking about the environment in which our students work, obviously none of us have control over <laughs> the behavior or, or, or settings of, of others that we, we might be working with. Um, but, you know, a lot of us work in environments where we're um, or working alongside other professions that might have different ethical standards, or we might be working with, um, gosh, a, just a, a diverse array of people with different um, attitudes that are that are different from social work, and that's and that is okay. All right, um, just do your best to kind of, I don't know, I don't want you to like shield the student from real life because that's not helpful, but you know, just just. Um, if, if you think that there are some, some dynamics in the environment where your student might be exposed to that maybe aren't the most appropriate, talk to your, talk to your directors, talk to your colleagues. Um, make sure that, that you're not exposing students to um, unnecessary internal information that's maybe not appropriate for interns to, to be privy to. Um, talking about client information that they don't need to know. Um, obviously, office politics and gossip, all that good stuff. I, I know y'all don't do that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just being aware of the environment in which you're bringing an intern into. Um, okay. Leave it on here while I um, continue on my soapbox with unsolicited advice. Okay. <laughs> now, I didn't write this down on the slide, so I want you guys to write these down. I have four points that I would like for you to write down. And I would also love to know y'all's unsolicited advice for being a successful field instructor, okay? So number one, build mutual trust. It's really important, especially when we're talking about engagement. Um, obviously, we want to build trust with our clients, but it's really important with your intern to build mutual trust, okay? You're entrusting them to help you work on some really intense client issues. You're entrusting them with confidential information. Um, you're also entrusting them with, <laughs> this is really macro, you guys, um, really philosophical, but they're the future of our profession, okay? So trusting that they can make sound decisions, um, that they can make good judgment calls, um, that they can make ethical decisions, that they can be professional. It takes a lot when, you know, someone's a new student and they're learning and it's hard to watch someone mess up, but, um, I think it's just really important to, to build that mutual trust with them. So they know that, okay, this is an ally in the field. This is somebody I can go to when I have a question about, hey, I think I'm experiencing an ethical dilemma. What do I do? Um, you're not there to be, a, be their friend, obviously. We know there's boundaries and stuff, but um, building that trust is really important. Okay. Oh, also this will model how they engage with clients. Um, number two. <laughs> Allow students to take ownership, okay? And this is kind of a two-part. So one is giving them an opportunity to lead. I think that's really important for students to be able to have ownership of a project that they can present on and say, <coughs> here, I, um, sorry, let me back up. Opportunities to take ownership. One is in leadership and the other one is projects. So if you have a passion project that you really want to get done, but don't have capacity to do, not grunt work. Interns are not free labor. Um, I mean, they're, yeah, they, they don't get paid, and that's right. <laughs> but they are not free labor to do your grunt work. If you have a passion project, something that your department needs to get done, um, see, see your intern as a partner in that project. Um, an example of that, and I'm going to embarrass my interns who are on the call right now, we have an amazing group of field interns this semester. Um, they started last semester. We call them STAM for Soul, Tara, Ashley, and Margaret. So STAM is present, they're on the call, they're amazing. Um, these are all foundation students and we handpicked them to help our department. At first, because we were like, oh, they need placements. Oh, I guess they can intern with us. And then it turned into the most beautiful, 
helpful, mutually beneficial um, partnership that we, could, we couldn't have even imagined. Um, Stan is doing program evaluation for field. They are reaching out to students. They are um, duet building contacts with new agencies, which is super helpful. Updating the website. Oh, by the way, you know that, that QR code we're all trying to log on to and it, it works, yay. Um, Stan has developed our new FAQ. It's so beautiful, y'all. So when it does get when it does get published, I want you to check it out. Check it out for yourself just to understand our many complexities of, of fields. Um, yeah, and they've been super helpful. They haven't. Um, yeah, so we've 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 treated Stan as our peers essentially. Um, they're they're our coworkers and they're they're our partners in this work. Okay, so giving them opportunities to develop projects. Also allow students to fail, okay? And what I mean by that is don't neglect them and just, you know, allow them to screw up. What I mean is this is a safe space for them to make mistakes and learn from them, okay? So obviously we're, I'm not talking about like, you know, egregious neglectful things where you're harming clients, all that good stuff. Um, what I'm talking about is allowing them to mess up and learn from it, coach them through maybe mistakes or maybe, um, maybe unprofessional <laughs> behavior they're here to learn and it's not gonna, I think sometimes, especially in, in human services, it's really easy to not want, it's easy to people please, it's easy to not want to cause conflict. Um, I know as a uh, recovering perfect, perfectionist and former people pleaser, it's hard to give critical feedback, but it's essential for this work. They will not grow, they will not learn. What are we doing if we're not doing that? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So constructive feedback, where they're not shamed about, you know, making a mistake, but that they're encouraged to, okay, let's think about doing this the right way or a different way. Let's think about a better way of, of solving this problem. And then number four, be authentic. That's why I had my stupid little hat on. <laughs> um, by nature, I'm uh, an otter. We did a, an animal personality test last semester with our team. I like to have fun at work. I think it's really important. Obviously, I'm very serious about work as well. Um, we have to we have to infuse fun in this job. We are dealing with way too much trauma, way too much stress, way too much burden to take that all in ourselves. So whatever authenticity looks like for you, that's awesome. I'm not saying you have to be BFFs with your interns, um, but bring your full self to to the the working relationship. Um, that includes telling them what it's like in the field, being real, being realistic. Um, you know, not every part of our profession is sexy, so <laughs> be real about it. But at the same time, I'm going to challenge you to kind of think of that balance, that yin and yang. Anytime you're talking about, oh man, I'm overloaded, I have a huge caseload, this funder's not coming through, oh my god, like I, I have way too much work. I want you to balance that with a strength, okay? So always think about there's so much trauma in the world, there's so much to be sad about in this profession, but there's also equally as much to celebrate, okay? So celebrate the strengths of your clients and of your intern. Look for the look for the good. I'm not saying like be positive all the time, like ignore the sad. Um, sometimes we have to to laugh to keep from crying, but I. Um, I just encourage you to balance it so that your student has a realistic ex expectation of what the field is like. Okay, I am done. I am off my soapbox. Who is next? <laughs> you can keep going. You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> you can visit. No. <laughs>
it's just going to keep recording and they can, yeah, they can take their break too. Okay. Yeah, I think answering questions about the therapy. Oh, good. Yeah, don't worry.
Dwight has touched him. Wait, where's the little thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a mess with this before I got here. Um, I'm used to having a mouse, y'all. Like, I keep grabbing, like, yeah, there's, there's a drawer that pulls out. Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Thanks. I didn't get that far. This is why it's all my coffee, so, you know. <laughs> all right. It's all good. We're all in this together. Yes. We'll figure it out. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Maybe. Just thinking about it. It's, me too. It's where I'm at. It's like, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Share your screen when it comes up. Okay. I used to have it. That's weird. It is good. Need some like inner like some music while we're trying to figure this out. Um, <laughs>
All right, so let's test it out this QR code, and make sure it works. I tested it the other day, so it did, so hopefully it still does. And let me go to, yes. Let me go to, so I'm going to show you where to find these different documents on our website. And as Vanessa mentioned, um, we are always updating our website as well, so just make sure you can um, get to the website, bookmark the page, and um, just be on the lookout for updates as well. So, let me see if I can get to... I'll just put in quick. Hold on. Let me go to this one. Okay, so here is our our main page that we showed you earlier when Vanessa was going over our website. Um, so on our main website, you'll see forms and documents right here. You can go to that, and it'll have links and all of that to different documents that you may need to use. Um, so learning contracts we do not have on our website. Um, learning contracts are currently kept on in place. Um, but we're going to go over that a little bit more, go over some examples of learning contracts. But um, all the learning contracts, weekly supervision, all of the hours are all kept currently on our in-place system. Um, but these are some additional forms and documents that are separate from, from in-place that you may need to use. So right here, the field instructors. And oh, that field, do that to all of you, start our registration form for today. Mm -hmm. I want to go to, let's see. Here we go. Um, so these forms are the ones that you may need um, outside of the in-place system. So a student requests to transfer to another placement, student requests to withdraw from a placement, interruption of field placement by field instructor, and the student performance agreement, which we call a SPA. So I'll go over each of those as well. Uh, but just wanted you to see where you can find that on our website. Um, let's see. Do we have? Do you want me to click these to see what they each look like, Natalie? I don't know. You know. Do you want me to go to each of these and just let them know what it looks like? Or just know where it's at. Just, okay. I mean, well, one that's maybe go over the small one for sure. Okay. Cool. And then okay. Cool. Um, so I'll just give a little overview on these, and then I'll open up the other ones that you most likely um, will need to use. Um, so the student would like to transfer to another placement. Um, that's a form that's not used often, um, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples on some approval examples that um, that may come up for a student needing to transfer to another placement. The expectation for students is that they are expected to stay with the same agency for both semesters if they're doing a split. Um, also with block as well, stay with the same agency. But um, there are you know situations that can come up to where a student may need to transfer to another placement. Um, so a couple of examples of that, um, regardless of the students being in communication with agency, being in communication with the field office, um, with the field education specialist and their field liaison professor of their class, um, of any changes or anything that are going on. Um, but a couple of examples for that um, would be um, either the agency is unable to provide enough hours for the student, um, agency is going through some staff changes, they're no longer able to provide the supervision for the student, <laughs> Um, and a couple of other examples, maybe a student had a, like a family emergency, medical emergency, they needed to move, um, something like that. Those are really type of emergency type situations um, that need to be reviewed ahead of time for a student to transfer to another placement. Um, so those do need to be approved by the field office, so the student would need to complete that form with their current agency and with their um, field liaison professor. Student requests to withdraw from a placement. We don't use that one too often um, either, but it is available if needed. Um, so this is for a student to complete if they start a field and again, you know, something happened to where they have to drop out of field for that semester. Um, again, either like you know, medical emergency, family emergency, financial, whatever it may be, um, they need to drop from their field class. So they would complete that form um, with the agency, letting them know they need to withdraw from their placement, and then at that point, they would communicate that, of course, with their um, with their field liaison professor, and they would then have to postpone and reapply to start field another semester. All right, 
So inter interruption of field placement by field instructor. I will pull that up so you all can see what that looks like. If it looks. <laughs> you got it. While it loads, I'll go over what it's about. So um, the interruption of field placement by field instructor is um, should I go over this one first because yeah, yeah. it kind of out of order. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go in order. Like the pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't give me a pop up. Try it. If it's a PDF, it's going to download it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you yeah. I just want to cook enough. Oh. oh. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, hold on. Don't say not. Where's the egg? Okay. Don't okay. Don't don't say don't say don't say say oh my. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Click it off enough to escape. Look at that. All right. Welcome to our world. Welcome to my brain. The brain of city tabs and clicking right. and all the things. All right. So. This is what we call the Student Performance Agreement, also known as a SPA. So this is a form that the field instructor would complete with their students um, and task supervisor as well, if, if applicable. Um, so this is a form to go over any, um, any concerns that come up you know, during supervision or anything that the field instructor has concern about as far as the student's performance. Um, and this is what they work on with the student. They sit down with the student communicate with them, um, talk about any concerns that are, you know, coming up, they've noticed, and then come up with goals, um, things to do to address that issue, and then a date on reevaluating um, towards addressing that goal and addressing that behavior. Um, so then the student would sign it, field instructor would sign it, task, super, task supervisor, if they have one as well, would sign it, and then, of course, um, communicating with the field liaison professor um, so they are aware as well. Um, but before, um, you know, hopefully we don't want students, our goal is to save the field placement and work with the students on that. So that way the student's not blindsided, the field office isn't blindsided. We want everyone to be on the same page. That's why communication is so important. Um, so we ask you to use this form first to address any concerns that you have with the students, save communication as well, so everyone is aware and on the same page. And then um, just keep, you know, keep us updated along the way. Um, and that's that's really what we want to do first. Again, save the field placement and work as much as we can to um, keep the student within the agency and save the placement. So use this form, please, um, to address any concerns or any behaviors, and then get to communicate with the student's field liaison professor, and then just keep them updated along the way. So that is where you will find this form. And then I'm going to get out of this one to go to the next one. And do all the clicking and things. Do that one. And then I'm going to go to the interruption of field placement form. Got it. Okay, now hold on. Click that. There we go. Oh, just one. All right. Cool. All right. So um, this is the interruption of field placement form. So it's um, if all the um, you know, student performance agreements, all the small forms that you've completed with the student, um, and anything that you've addressed with the student. If unfortunately it, it does not improve and it comes to the point of needing to terminate the student from their field placement, then this is the form that the agency would need to complete and use um, uh, with the student and also the field liaison professor as well. Um, so it gives a couple of um, different examples. Obviously, we need to know the reason why um, the student is being terminated from their placement and so you can take a look at all of those. Um, there's also um, other or if there's any uh, additional notes that you need to include with that. Um, and then of course um, any additional documentation, emails, um, you know, text messages, um, any other type of documents that you have, um, additional comments, you can include that on there as well. Um, so then the field instructor would need to sign, the student would need to sign, and then the field liaison professor would sign as well. 
Hopefully you're successful, and that's why we have the student performance agreement that we would ask you to use first um, to address those issues. And then, of course, communicate with the field liaison professor, because if we don't know that something is going on, then we can't intervene and help and assist along the way. Um, again, we don't want anyone to be blindsided by that, and that's why we ask for documentation to make sure that everything is, everyone's on the same page with everything going on. All right. Um, Get back to these. Yeah, those green lines. Okay. All right. Um, so again, that's the those are the additional forms that you may need outside of in place that you can find on the website. And of course, if you have any trouble, if you have trouble finding it, just reach out to your field liaison professor and they can provide those forms to you as well if you need them. So documents that are currently found um, in our current in-place system are the learning contracts, which is not called learning contracts, so that is confusing, um, especially if a student or a new field or field instructor is new to um, to doing this. Um, it's in place, so you know it's not labeled learning contracts. It is labeled field evaluation process, and. <laughs> That I have to tell that to all the students and make sure I let the field instructors know because it's not labeled learning contract, it's field evaluation uh, process, and it includes the learning contract. It also includes the midterm and the final evaluations all within that evaluation process. So that is where all of those are located. Um, and then the supervision logs and all the hours timesheets, um, students need to make sure that they're, like Adrian was saying, log it every week um, if possible if not every day it's what i always tell my students because you want them scrambling at the end and we want to you know they want to be respectful of your time too so that way you can review it and know that they're on track as they go along throughout the semester do it yes um yes so the supervision logs are included within the timesheet so as the student completes um their logbook entry for that particular day it'll have an option on did you have supervision that day they can include you know different comments on the topics that were discussed um, and then once the student submits that logbook entry it'll go to you as the field instructor to be able to review it and then you approve it and then that's good so that you'll only see it if the student has submitted it if it's in draft form or if they need to um, make any changes then you won't be able to see that particular logbook entry until the student submits that for your approval um, if you do need to you do have the option when you review students um, hours and the supervision logs that are within the, the, the timesheet um, you have the option to add your own comments or you can send it back for revision and the student can make any type of changes that they need to do and then they submit it for your approval. All right. All right, so we kind of went over this already, a supervisory documentation. Um, again, we went over that student performance agreement, the SPA form, the interruption of field placement form, um, student request withdrawal from field, and student request a transfer. And so I went over a couple of examples for that. Um, you know, again, it's emergency type of situations. But bottom line, we just need to have constant you know, clear communication so that way everyone's on the same page and knows what's going on. All right. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you for bearing with me as I figured out all of the all the things. Hello again, I'm Monica Brown. I am the field advisor. I work mainly with children and family students, but right now I'm interim for CAT, Health, and Aging. So if you have any of those students who will be contacting with me uh, for summer, um, probably fall too. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to be going over our uh, student population and the roles and responsibilities of um, our students we expect from our students and just wanting you guys to reinforce with the students. Uh, see. So the students, uh, their role in there is just to be learning from you guys and trying to um, become 
future social workers, that they're um, going to be working on the learning contract, which is one of their main assignments they'll be doing in this semester with you. Um, they are supposed to be doing this in conjunction with you. It's not something that you do on your own. It's something that you do hand in hand with the student. And it's not something the student does on their own either, because they need your assistance to kind of help them fill in what type of tasks and duties they can do to learn these competencies, because they're still in the process of learning the competencies, so they won't be able to fill this out independently. Um, they're, they're required to put in their, their weekly supervision logs and hours and document everything. Like Andrea was mentioning earlier, we recommend that they do it once a week just to keep them on schedule. Um, and also because when we do the midterm calls and everything like that, we check to see where they are with their hours and their supervision logs to see that they're on the on time schedule. It's also easier for you guys as the field instructor so that you don't have so many to approve because most of the times you're having to approve the logs one at a time so that you don't have so much to do at one setting because towards the end of the semester we have a very short turnaround when we're needing all the documentation approved to get their grades in and um, that's when you'll get the most emails and, and complaints from students coming from coming at you like hey my professor needs this by tomorrow and I have like 75 hours I still need you to approve and so you're you know you have your own schedule and things that you're working on as well so we just recommend that everybody kind of check in once a week if possible if not just kind of set a schedule that works for you but try to just check in at least every couple of weeks to make sure that you're uh, on target with signing their documentation. Um, making sure that you look, make sure that students are following your agency's policies and procedures and making sure that they understand what your agency's policies and procedures are. Um, if you guys don't offer an orientation, I would recommend that that's something that you consider doing so that from the very beginning, students understand what their expectations are as an intern at your agency. Um, most of the questions that we get in the field office when students come to us is that they're saying that they're not understanding um, what the roles are for them as interns with your agencies and they don't feel like a lot of times that their field instructors might like explain things correctly to them or they're being told that they're doing something wrong but not being explained as to what they're doing wrong. So just making sure from the very beginning that everybody is on the same page and have a clear understanding of their expectations, it'll just make the process for their practicum go a lot smoother. Um, so managing expectations so as we started off with saying like remember when you were an intern what your experience was like what you wanted out of your placement what you wanted out of your field instructor um, students sometimes have um, a lot of expectations of their placement sometimes are uh, realistic and unrealistic I'm just helping them to manage their expectations of what the field is going to be like. For most of the students, this is their first introduction into social work altogether. They may not have ever had any work experience, so they may not understand like what um, documentation is and, and how to document or what um, doing a, um, any type of assessment is. And you just understand like their, that fear of not wanting to do something incorrectly and being um, told that it's wrong or just wanting to not mess up in something you know, like that anxiousness and worry. And so just being able to um, help the students manage their expectations, um, being able to come to you as their field instructor and feel like they can talk to you openly about anything they may be doing correctly or incorrectly. Um, the biggest thing they're saying is like we hear from students is that they sometimes don't feel like they have much interaction with their field instructors. Like they may only see you once a week and it's only for the supervision or it's in passing or um, outside of you know that supervision time they can't talk to you at all they don't have any kind of contact with you so we're just asking that you help them manage their expectations like if your schedule with them is going to be limited to that supervision time then they should be aware of that in the beginning that they'll have um, most of the communication with the task supervisor just making sure they understand the chain of command for your agency so that we don't get those complaints here at the school that they're not in any communication with their field instructor they've never seen you heard from you or anything like you just find their time and that's it um, just meeting the students where they are, like we were saying, for the, most of the students, this is going to be their first experience into the <coughs> world of social work altogether. And I remember myself as an intern, I came in as a foundation student. I did not have my bachelor's in, in um, social work. I was a psychology student. We didn't do interns, internships in psychology, so I had no experience. I was very, very nervous. I was very, very worried about everything. Documentation, I wanted to make sure I did it so detailed that it was too long. <laughs> I was writing novels and they were like, okay, this is not gonna work. <laughs> but um, yeah, just making sure that your students are understanding that it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to like provide, give that good feedback and, and making sure that they're understanding that even if they mess up, that that's okay, they're in the learning process, it's expected for them to mess up, but that you prefer them to actually ask the questions to you and come to you to kind of figure out what's 
being done appropriately, what's being done inappropriately. So in the, in the situation which Sharon was mentioning where you might have to use a spa in worst case scenario, go to the interruption of the field practicum, um, just that would happen when the students are not managing their expectations when they're struggling in the setting. Sometimes that happens regardless of how well you can identify areas and, and work with the student. They may like what Andrew was saying, may not just be cut out for this, this field. Um, and sometimes that happens and that, that can kind of, kind of counteract with their behavior coming out where they're having the attitude where it's like, well, you're not really teaching me very well. I'm not really learning anything, in, anything from you. And those situations, as long as you're documenting everything and keeping everything in contact with these spa, like if you set the time frame and you know when the time happens and they haven't met any improvements, then obviously the only goal you can go to is a termination. Um, we completely understand that with agencies. We want you guys to have a good um, process with our interns as well. Um, Yeah, so inappropriate behaviors would just be what's listed addressing these behaviors immediately, um, asking the students for their point of view, making sure that they understand why it's deemed inappropriate in your agency, like what they did. Because sometimes we have students that have been sent to um, professional standards for things and they don't feel like they did anything wrong because it was never really, it was really not explained to them. Um, according to the agency that they were working at, why this is a problem or, or the student doesn't view it the same way that the field instructor does. So just making sure that if you, you do come to the forms of the spas or the terminations that everybody understands, this is why you're being let go from our agency. This is why we can no longer take you on for the remainder of the semester or the following semester. Um, and just making sure that they understand if you do a spa, that that doesn't mean that you're letting them go. The spa is the first one that you do when they have any type of behavioral issues or concerns. So making sure, because a lot of times students will freak out when a spa happens because they're already on the fence of thinking that from that moment on, they can't come to you about anything because you um, are trying to find a way to get rid of them. So just making sure that you're, you're addressing that, you understand that this is um, an area that they're not necessarily succeeding in, that you want them to be the best social worker they can be. And for me, I always recommend doing the uh, compliment sandwich where you start off with a compliment of strengths, how they're doing, what they're doing well, and then pile in all the areas of, of <laughs> correction and areas of where you need improvement and then finish off with another compliment. So it's like, at least when you're leaving, it's like, well, she did say that, you know, it was good with my time doing it. I mean, she said I had all these other areas, but I mean, she did say I was good with time managing. So. <laughs> to work a little bit better because I know for most people you remember the one thing somebody said that you did wrong versus the, the hundreds of things that they said you did positive so if you do the compliment sandwich it's a little easier to take because the last thing they told you was something positive and next um, well our field coordinator Chris is going to be talking to you guys about our placement system in place if you guys have been working with us you already know how that goes so he's going to go into more detail for you yeah, in place. <laughs> in place. Yay, in place. Okay. Let's talk about in place. In place. Everybody in the audience right now, how many are new to in place? How many? Okay. Okay, so you haven't suffered yet. Like <laughs> So, or you might have as you try to navigate look for something, you're like, I don't understand this. Okay, so in place is, um, as we know, our intern management system, database, whatever acronym term you want to throw on it. Um, the biggest issues with in place are um, the, sorry, my brain. I've only had one cup of coffee this morning. Um, the issues that you guys will see on your end usually tend to be you can't log in. You can see your student, but you can see nothing else. You can see their log books, but you can't see their um, learning contract, field evaluations. It's like I've seen these before, right? You uh, can see all of it, but you can't prove it. Okay, so the big thing to remember is, one, I need you guys to email me these problems. Don't tell the student to email me, because the first thing I'm gonna tell the student is, have your film instructor email me this, because I need to see screenshots. The reason I need to see screenshots is the way I see it in place is completely different from the way you see it. Um, it's, it's a night and day difference the way it looks. So 90% of the problems that you guys have already know how to fix. Um, you see it on my end, and if it's not on my end, I recognize that I have to send it to in place. 
Um, the good news with that is the four in place would kind of take two or three days to fix something. Now they're a lot quicker because they don't like me because I pester them and I contact their corporate office and I contact their director of North American operations and I say, I need this fixed now. So they work really fast to get me to go away. Um, so some of you may have already had this already, but before when we leave today, we're going to send you guys out the new updated guide to in place. Um, I've been sending out to people that have reached out to me since I've gotten it uh, back in a month ago with issues. So I'm going to send it out to everybody today that's here and online. So you'll have it. The good thing about this guide is, is the instructions have been slightly updated, so they make a little bit more sense. But more importantly, they've updated the screenshots within the guide. So now you can actually see what they're, what you should be seeing instead of going, that screenshot doesn't look anything like I see. Um, it only took them six months to get me that because I've been begging for it for six months. But hey. Um, so the good news and bad news within place right now is bad news is we're still using it for summer, most likely through fall. And the reason I say that is because we have been authorized to move into a new system. Now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what that new system is <laughs> at this time, but I can tell you that this new system is night and day difference in usability, especially for your end. I have talked to no less than five different major universities that use this new system. Um, I had an hour and a half long conversation with the field director of the University of Kentucky, who uses this. She is also on their committee for improvement with this new system. Um, the, the cons of it, as we all know, there'd be cons to the program. Cons are on my end, in my end alone. The field instructors, the agency contacts, those things, you guys will not have this anywhere near the issues that you have now. Um, it's completely, it's just better, honestly. Um, it, it really is. Um, our goal is to hopefully soft launch it into the fall, but by next spring we'll be fully in it 100%. And um, if, if some of you may have students from other universities and may be using this program, but I can tell you right now that it's not data difference from in place. It's amazing. Um, it does everything we want it to do. It does everything we need it to do very simply, step by step. They have provide us um, with support materials, both videos, step-by-step -step instruction videos, guides, one-on-one, -on -one, everything's made. Um, so we're, right now it's just in the final contracts. And as we all know in this room, you got to go through the red tape to get there. So um, so just hang with us. If you have problems with in-place, please, please email me. Um, I will do everything I can to get it taken care of as fast as I can get it taken care of. Um, some of the other problems that just dawned on me, I'm sorry. I'm, one cup of coffee. Um, if you have multiple roles, so within in place, meaning you're a primary contact with the agency and you also do field instruction. The in place guide doesn't tell you to do this, and I kind of got aggravated because I told them specifically I needed this in there. But you will have multiple views of your group. And so in that right hand corner, you'll see a drop down menu with your username. If you're doing both roles, you will always log in and it will always show you your field instructor view. If you need to go to your agency primary contact view, you'll have to go to that drop-down menu and change it to agency account view. And that'll let you do things like student requests, add personnel, all that stuff. But again, the guy doesn't say that, unfortunately. And if you get, if you forget, that's okay, email me and I'll send it to you because that's what they pay me for, right? Um, I had this whole thing planned out on my way here driving in this morning. It's, <laughs> right? it's kind of hard to take notes when you're driving. Um, staff changes. Staff changes? Yeah. Yes, thank you. If primary contact folks, um, if you have staff changes, meaning that you have field instructors leaving or joining and you need them added, please let me know. I can take care of that for you. Um, if you are leaving or you're promoting up or you're changing roles within the agency, please, please let me know. Um, because I need to update the, in, the agency page to do that new primary contact. If you don't have somebody new yet, so there's just an interim, that's okay. Tell them, give me that information anyway, because I got to have something in there. 
Otherwise, in place will just lose its mind. Um, <laughs> even more so than it already does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's in place. Yeah. I just, every day I walk in, I'm like, why does it do this? Um, and the fun part is, in place. we are breaking up with it. it exactly. It's probably. Um, <laughs> but the biggest takeaways to this part is one, let me know if you have any problems. Even if you think it's a silly problem, or even if you think I'm missing a step, that's okay, ask me. I'm in the system every day. So I will know exactly what you're looking for, how to get to it quickly. Don't kill yourself trying to get to it and, and spend hours looking for it. Or like, I know I knew how to do this. That's okay, ask me, that's what I'm here for. Um, just if it's after five o'clock, you're not gonna get an email from me until eight in the morning, so 7.30. Um, and then the, big, the other thing is um, send me screenshots of errors and stuff because if you just tell me you get an error code, I need to know what to send in place because 90% of the time they can't recreate it. So if I have a screenshot and I send it, then they can go, oh, okay, we see what the problem is. Um, sometimes the error codes I have found if you log out while back in, take care of itself because it's on the server side, but I won't know until you send me stuff. Um, where is this? I put this together yesterday, guys. <laughs> so, so going for the fall, um, we are not going to use in place for fall stuff. What we're doing is um, this afternoon we're going to send out an agency request uh, survey through Question Pro. It'll come through the email that you've given us. Um, that goes back to me and Amanda, and we will pull that data and put it into a spreadsheet for the advisor news. It's like literally three questions. It's probably a lot simpler than in place did, more than likely. Um, I try to keep things simple so that the, the more complicated we make things, the worse things get. So it's it won't be um, the same as in place, but it'll work probably better. Um, just know it'll be in a question pro link and not an in place link like you've seen in the past, like you've seen in the past. Um, in fact, I had a student call her field advisor, academic advisor, she thinking that the all application was a spam email <laughs> because it came through question pro and they're like this is this must be fake right this is a phishing scam no it's not it's the new thing for fall so um but for for fall field student requests it's going to come in a question pro form it's like i said three questions four questions tops just submit it um, if you're not sure if it went through a way, just email me because I can see it on my end if it went. Should send you an email that says thank you for your submission, but question pro gets a little weird sometimes with that. Um, but if you have a question, just email me. Um, if you can't get a hold of me, then email Amanda. Amanda can always find me. Um, almost always. <laughs> she also lives like seven miles from my house, so maybe she'll come and knock on my door. <laughs> Answer your emails. Um, the in place link is how to log in, so it's just in place.eta.edu. Like um, if you have not been activated your in place account, um, you probably need to send me an email because there's an expiration date on that link to set up that password that's not in that email. It's like 24 to 48 hours. So if you haven't done that yet, gotten around to it yet, send me an email when you can, and I'll send you a password reset link to reset that clock so you can log in. Um, other than that, I don't think I've covered anything. If you have again, if you have any questions about in place, just call me or email me. Don't call me. Who's next? What is it? Where? Just click the PowerPoint. No, pull out the drawers. I didn't do that earlier, so I can help you. <laughs> I haven't been on this end. I've been on the other side before. <laughs> okay. Yay! Yay! Okay, the problem is Change a little bit 
for a special day, but we're going to kind of go through these. Um, I am also going to pull up some examples of some learning contracts so you can kind of see what they look like. Um, and then we also were thinking if there's a competency that any of you have struggled with coming up with task for, um, we're going to ask for you to tell us that and we can go over it. Um, the field office can all chime in. We'll just, it's just going to be a big discussion. So, I'm going to first tell us. Uh, the, let's go ahead and we'll just start. Like I said, the BSW learning contract and the foundation learning contract are exactly the same. So we'll just talk about these two first. Okay. Who takes BSWs and foundation students? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So this is, I'll just scroll down real quickly. This is what it looks like. This is what is in, on in place currently. It will also, I'm pretty sure it's going to be in our new system as well, so you will always fill it out through this system. Um, just a quick little thing, as you can see, let me go back up to the top so you can see what the little numbers are. So there's a little guide here at the top. Um, we want you to obviously put numbers if, if any of these relate to how you're going to evaluate this competency. Um, and then, of course, you just look at these, and down here on these contracts, this is where you will come up with tasks that the students will do throughout the placement, um, either block over the one semester, both semesters. Um, we always tell students, if y'all are okay with the same learning contract for the second half of the, you know, second half of the placement, you can <laughs> play the exact same one. So you can kind of... Oh, there you go. Better? Let's do more. Yeah. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was small. Okay. So, um, so anyway, this is what they look like. Let me show you real quick what an advanced one looks like. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do the BSW. Now we'll go to look at that again. Okay. So, are there any? You want me to pull up the other competencies? I guess we just scroll through these. Is there anyone that does the BSW foundation? Is there any of the competencies that you remember having difficulty with, or any of these that you need answers for? Uh, engage in policy practice. Yeah. We're a medical micro direct care hospice. Mm -hmm. And like we get told three levels going all the way to Washington D.C. what to do and how to do our job, and we have zero control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> number five, you mentioned. Yes, I'm number five. It was. I was like, I did. Okay. I mean, we've come up with things mm -hmm. before, but it is, um, and I've heard from other students that a lot of agencies say we don't know how we're going to help. You. So I'm going to get, yeah, I was going to say, Andrew, do you have some good ideas for that? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, so the question was, what are some good examples of tasks that we can assign to students for the policy competency if we're working in a place where we can't really change the policy? Let me clarify, that's not really the goal of this. I totally get what you're saying, totally get it. I think it's important in this, in this competency to allow students to explore what those policies are at the lo local, hyper-local, you know, maybe city level, go to the state level, go to the national level. Explore what policies kind of bind your work, essentially. Um, have them do a policy analysis. Okay, so I actually have a template for this. I think I've sent out, have y'all have y'all received a virtual activities list PDF from me ever? Dr. Jones, yes. Okay, we will send that out today. Um, <laughs> so one of the tasks on there is a, a quick policy analysis. I will be the first to admit, I'm not a policy professor. This is just something that I, um, I used to work in refugee resettlement. We had a lot of different policies thrown at us all the time, um, mostly federal for how we did our work. Um, but I kind of developed a, a method for policy analysis for our students to kind of understand on a local level, but also a, an international level, how all these affected our clients, okay? So one thing I like to encourage students to do is 
All right, pick a policy at the, let's talk about the, the state level, okay? So in healthcare, we might talk about, um, and granted this isn't political, okay? This is literally just policies that affect our work. Okay, so let's just talk about social workers in general. Let's talk about the policy that our new state legislature has removed the, let's just talk about a, a policy that affects everybody in this room right now. Our state legislature, our accrediting body for, um, not accrediting body, licensure body, has recently removed the CEU um, expect or CEU provision for field instructors to receive CEUs for doing this really massively important crucial work. So you could even tell that to students as an example of a state level policy that very much impacts not just them, but also you as their field instructor and the future of our profession. Okay. So I know that's very hyper local to you know what we're dealing with here in the school of social work. But other other policies that might affect you. Okay, so when I was working in the in the refugee agency, that was I guess it was it was it was a couple of years ago. Let's just say that. And there was some um, there were some policies that were coming coming down through the governor around the border around um, people seeking asylum, um, and that was very crucial to our work. So I what I would do is I would tell students read the policy, read the actual policy from the state legislature. Um, and talk about, okay, which clients does this affect? How does this affect my student, or I'm sorry, my client population? Um, what are the benefits of this policy, if any? What are the negative impacts? Um, how, do, what is the ripple effect? Like if this policy stays true, what's that, what is that going to cause? Um, I know another example that a lot of students have used in the past too is um, years ago and you know, there's, opportunity for Texas to expand Medicaid and that opportunity was not taken. Um, what does that do to affect uninsured people in the state of Texas? Um, especially when we have so many children who are uninsured too. Um, just allow them to explore some of the policies that bind your work. So that could also be office policies too. If you wanted to explore um, why we have certain um, policies at the hospice level at uh, in hospitals, in healthcare, why do we require our students to go through so many vaccinations and stuff like that? They can pick literally any policy that affects them or their clients and just do an analysis. Um, other things that I know you've probably heard of and, and maybe your coursework as well is advocacy. That kind of goes with competency number three. That's the social justice competency. I like to tell students your policy and advocacy activities can kind of go hand in hand. Say you analyze the policy for number five and then you actually develop a plan of action of what you're going to say when you call your congressman or congresswoman um, for your advocacy piece. Um, I will say too, with these learning contracts, you can allow students to duplicate activities if they fall under multiple competencies, because rarely is our work packaged in you know, one dimension. Um, just make sure they know the difference between an advocacy activity, like advocacy is action. Policy is more research and analysis. That's just how my brain works. Um, does that help? What, what other examples for policy have y'all used? So to do a, um, they also do like research projects around, so they may do like um, volunteerism on the weekend with say the homeless population and the new legislation around moving them and reducing the tent cities. And so they have to do a report, an end report um, at the end of the semester to tell how that policy impacted on the community level. And so they do similar to a community assessment, um, but with policy. Awesome. Yeah, and I think the real, the real purpose of this too is to analyze um, all right, which policies do we have the power to advocate for and change? Sure. But also just knowing what those policies are that dictate our work, um, understanding, encouraging your student to do some research on your grant funding for your agency. There's a lot of rhyme and reason behind which money we can, which different kinds of money we can get for our funding our programs. So let your student look into that, you know, tell them which, which policies apply and why, why, um, we have to fall under fall under these things in order to get funding, um, but also what can we like? What recommendations would we have? That's the next part of the policy analysis. Is what recommendations would you provide, even if it's all hypothetical? But just coach your student through what would you do if you had the power to change this? 
what would that do to affect our clients? What would that do for our service provision? What would that do for our funding? So th this is kind of a creative exercise. What else? Is there any other policies you want to, or not policies? Other policies, <laughs> any other competencies we want to go over? Research. Research? Yeah. <laughs> These are usually the two that we get a lot of questions about. And a lot of times, if you have, <laughs> yeah, if you have a split placement student, you'll notice like at the end of the first semester, they'll be like, I did all the diversity and, and ethics and engagement and all the fun stuff. And then they're like, for second semester, they're like, I just haven't like gotten into my policy or research stuff because it looks boring. And I'm like, okay, I get it, but also this is super important to our work. <laughs> so do it. Um, so research, examples of research. Does anybody have a good example? Yes. Thesis. Okay. We always had to make it more targeted to our last year's placement, and so I was able to do a lot of that to be a part of it. Nice. Okay. So, um, what was your name? Heather. Heather. So what Heather shared, um, just for those online, because I know it's kind of hard to hear, um, is that she used uh, her thesis, um, like probably, probably literature reviews, all your references, all the things that you were already using for class. Did your own research. Yeah, a lot of our students did um, their own testing and everything else. I think a published thesis. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. So you got to participate in like real live actual research, not just like a research activity. <laughs> yeah, it just was real. I had to do it. And it was all spread from the people in the university. Awesome. Everything, yeah. That's great. We do have the thesis option that the students can do either the thesis option or they do an integrative seminar. So an integrative seminar is more like just a very large case study mm -hmm. based on a practice that they did, but um, not a lot choose the thesis option, but yeah. we do have some that do. <laughs> well, and we also have professors here at UTA, the School of Social Work, who are doing their own research yeah. projects. Um, so, and they're always like including students in that. So yeah, if your student's struggling with this, um, we definitely have some out, out, outlets for that. Another thing that I like to suggest to students is do a literature review on a certain topic. You can kind of combine this with policy. What I'm saying is work smarter, not harder. You can combine some things. That's cool. Um, but it, it's the point of this competency is to remind students that our work is all based in research. Our evidence is all based in evidence. It is not just some made up thing that we're doing because it feels good. We <laughs> this is science. OK. So, um, so just reminding them that if there's any question on a modality that you're using with your clients, a certain sort of therapeutic method, or um, that, you know, there's a rhyme and reason to how you deliver your services, challenge the student by saying, what, what um, research can you find that backs up why we do this? Um, go back to, um, I don't know, the people who created this grant to, uh, to discover what are the, res the, the resources that they, that they use to prove why we needed this funding based on which, which, what evidence. How do we know that this is going to work? Andrea? Yes. Uh, Kimberly Fairbanks uh, said mock testimony for public hearing. Ooh, mock <laughs> testimony for public hearing. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> So where would that follow? I guess that would fall under intervention. No, mock, mock testimony. Any activity that y'all have your students doing, we can put it in, a, in the learning contract. So just know that there is there is a way we can categorize every single thing that your students are doing. Mock testimony for trial. Policy. Oh, I see. Awesome. That's how I explain it to my students because they're like, I don't like research and mm -hmm. all of that. So if you're doing the practice from a state, like you said, a theoretical standpoint, um, then it's research informed practice too. So as long mm -hmm. as you can show that practice mm -hmm. and um, they do final product to show how they implemented the research informed practice. Okay, Dr. Jones, <laughs> do you want to come here? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Y'all, this is Dr. Jones. She heads up Positive Pursuits. They are an amazing macro-level organization, um, and she knows 
everything social. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that was great. Um, yeah, it's practice informed research and research informed practice. So it's both. What else? Other competencies? We want to go over. We are we are actually putting together some sample learning contracts for every concentration. So just know that that is coming. Yes. I just wanted to put in a word for competency for practice informed research. As a hospice, one of the things that I have started having students do because for oh, 25 years I had students say, "Oh, I'm going to read a journal article and then." Mm -hmm do a summary or a report back to you and in the third week of April I would be asking them so what journal article did you read oh I kind of forgot I was supposed to do that mm -hmm. and I get two because I'm not the student sure <laughs> you're like this is your learning so, so cool. I now tell them in the second week of August you can't put a journal article in that section that's not allowed sorry go get another agency if you want to do that because yeah. I don't because it never works, no yeah. offense to future students. They all set the pace for you. But what we do do, because we're healthcare and it works for us, we use scaling questions. Ooh, scaling questions. Okay. And they are and the miracle question. They already know about that. And if they're not as familiar, maybe they took that class a semester or two ago, I roll it back out to them on a scale of one to ten or um, the faces assessment of pain and distress because so much of what interns do mm -hmm. is the more emotion based friendly social support psw level mm -hmm. um those kinds of yeah. things legacy building story keeping life review um and i joke but i think some of them actually do it like for people that are anxious or sad how do they feel when you get there and then watch a couple of funny cat videos on YouTube? Not that I say that that's real evidence based practice, but <laughs> I, I make it a funny example and then I'm like, they probably do that. I don't know. Um, and then what was your number at the end of the visit? Mm -hmm. And you're looking for, oh, yeah, it's a three and it was a six when you got here. So what you're saying is infusing, yeah. So what you're saying is infusing metrics into practice. Yes. Yeah. Because that's the essence of evidence. Yep. Is a lower number of a bad thing or a higher number of a good thing, mm -hmm. and they can just get that so quick. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's a great. That's I mean, a great point. I, yeah. I do tell them to look up stuff to reinforce that. Sure. That's and it kind of, that kind of bleeds into like assessment and evaluation. Again, all this stuff is. Oh, it's all connected. Um, but yeah, infusing ways to evaluate practice, even if it's just kind of not something maybe you normally do for your agency, but you're kind of doing it as an, as an exercise for your student, that'll make a huge, huge difference in the way that they view how we can make data work for us um, in, in, a, in a field that a, a lot of times we're working with gray. What else? I know we're talking about foundation and BSW, but we can go to advanced. Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, I think that uh, if we can move, I know usually in the third or fourth week is when they're due. Um, a lot of times, you know, they're just in orientation. So, it's hard for them, the students themselves, to really, because I task them with actually looking over their learning contract and based on their what they think they're going to be doing. Um, but I think if we could have it pushed out just a little bit, just because mm -hmm. some of them don't even have the their direct placement or what they're going to be doing by week three or four. So you're suggesting moving the deadline back from the for the learning contract? Yeah. 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 Just, a, just a little, you know, yeah. not uh, all the way to midterm, but if you mm -hmm. want them to to really, you know, grasp it and be able to provide those activities. If they're not assigned to their what they're going to be doing for their field, at they don't three, know. Yeah. Then they're just you know putting putting that's things true. on there. And I think that's what's important about these learning contracts, y'all, is that they don't students don't do this by them by themselves. They do it with you. Um, it's going to look a little different. This is the PDF version, but um, you'll do this in the in place portal, in in place. Um, and it kind of stays. It kind of stays there. You can't really change it. But I mean, if you want to print out a, a paper copy or have, have a student have an editable copy, I think that's fine. 
Um, but yeah, you'll do it with them. So sometimes students will attempt to do this on their own and it, they, they just don't know. They don't know what to put for tasks. Um, so that's where we really need your help, especially in the beginning, um, especially when they're brand new to social work and they haven't done this before. Um, so kind of having some default tasks kind of at the ready, maybe a sample, like again, like I said, we're gonna provide some sample learning contracts, but if y'all wanna go ahead and keep like a running sample learning contract in your own files of tasks specific to your agency, um, we don't wanna like, give them all of the answers, but I mean, just just having some on hand um, as they're continuing to create their own ideas um, is fine. It's encouraged, actually. For those online, we are considering moving the learning contract deadline back. Yeah, we yeah. Okay, who wants to talk about an advanced one? Who wants to talk about an advanced one? <laughs> I don't know how to navigate away from this. Um, so I've got a white one versus white learning contract. Yep. Oh. And then turn that. VSW. <laughs> okay, what do we want? Aging, cap, children, families, health. I see mental health. When I had mental health students in my last yeah. job, we were always really confused yeah, by this yeah, learning yeah. contract. So, <laughs> Sharon, do you mind It's a lot of the same tendencies, mm -hmm. but of course, it always focuses around the session. So, that's what we Okay. Anybody have an objective that they want clarification on, or do you want us to just kind of go through? Who's mental health? Anybody have mental health students? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just do number one. one. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're want to have time for questions at yeah. the end too. So. All right. So let's give y'all a minute just to read that over. So we'll just look at objective number one: practice active self-reflection and continue to address. Personal bias and effective uh, responses to stereotypes to build knowledge, critical thinking skills, and dispel myths regarding diverse mental health substance abuse issues. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. All right so we've got a minute to think about that. I think who works with mental health students? Can y'all um, provide us an example for some tasks that you've I know it's going to depend on the agency and all that, but do y'all have any examples that you can think of? But I think it's very important when you do the weekly supervision for the task supervisor to be involved with that because it doesn't have to be in person, it can be virtual. 
So I think, um, you know, just expressing that to your agency as well, because, you know, it may be coming from different departments, different locations, but everyone needs to be on the same page because you're working with the student on the day-to-day -day tasks and activities. So you should be able to see, you know, the learning contracts so that way you can have, be familiar with that. Um, even though you won't, um, the field instructor needs to be the one to sign off, you know, on the learning contract and all the hours, you're still involved with them every day. So um, mm -hmm. it's very important um, for task supervisors to be involved with that. And I always suggest for everyone to task supervisor, field instructor, and student to all meet on a weekly basis or, or even have a separate time as well. Um, I you can do it virtually. Mm -hmm. But I, I uh, the field uh, supervisor has been just a little. I would say of maybe 30 expectations sort of, mm -hmm. and we would kind of break that on you be that based on those. Right. But I think having that directly in front of you uh, and working with the students. Mm -hmm. It does. <coughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Gotcha. So, okay. So we're working on getting some sample learning contracts together mm -hmm. because you know that would be very helpful. Um, so yes, that is in the works right now on getting some example learning contracts to send out um, to you know, new field instructors or everyone that um, just to have as a point of reference. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yes. Sorry, I think that kind of covered this, but mm -hmm. um, I want to take it back on that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. We have a contract. I work for the fire department for the city. Mm -hmm. And so our city manager, the deputy city manager, is the MSW, so she mm -hmm. is the field instructor. Mm -hmm. She is the nurse for the new public health program. Mm -hmm. student. I'm the task instructor. So okay. we've done this you know, mm -hmm. really hard on this uh, contract. And Great. Kind of what I'm hearing is the student's supposed to be involved, but we don't need to submit it permanently because once you put it in place, it's done. So we need to wait till we get our students to. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Because this is the first thing that you're going to work on with the student when they get started. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. I think it's important, though, to have just to have an idea of what tasks you would want to see on here. Obviously, they can they can y'all can co-create, you know, new ones. But if you just kind of have a template mm -hmm. for this is what I expect from my interns every semester. You're going to do case notes. You're going to do mm -hmm. self-reflection. You're going to do research stuff. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that's that saves you time. Yeah. You know, um, and then whatever tasks they want to, you want to add on to that is fine. We have a line. We um, have a question online. Sandra Lowe, but um, they have a, they have the interns write a brief description mm -hmm. of what a person coming in substance abuse treatment looks like. Mm -hmm. And then on day one, and then revisit this and have more research specifically on who is impacted by it. So, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's great. Do you mind? Um, sorry, I don't feel everyone heard that. Um, so Natalie was saying there was a suggestion from the chat. Um, so they have the student do like a self um, reflection summary on what they feel, I guess, from their perspective on. Um, the person that has dealt with mental health or substance misuse. Oh, for this for this one. For this That's one. for this yes. specifically. Okay. And um, and then they um, reevaluate later on. That's and great. Did I understand that correctly? No. Okay. Yeah. Any other ideas for this one? I don't know. We want to have some time for other questions before we go on the tour. <laughs> Oh, sure. Can I go into it? Mm -hmm. uh, I did like a supervision with them of uh, being able to kind of like sit with it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you have your gut reaction, recognize your gut reaction, right. sit with it. Why am I having this reaction to the client? Mm -hmm. to, uh, whether it's disgust, anger, sympathy, empathy, mm -hmm. like, why have that reaction? And the student mm -hmm. had a really good discussion. Like, we did that. Was, oh my God, I had that moment. Mm -hmm. to recognize yeah, it, good. sit there. Because it was a woman who found out her husband of like over a decade was gay. He came out of gay in a very conservative Christian family. They have kids. The wife is our client. And so she started talking about her husband, about all the things that was wrong with him, and all these things. And so she 
wanted to go in the education mode of like it's joy, like he, you know, this is going on. And I'm sure he grew up in a he grew up in a Christian family as well, so you know, shove that down, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm like, you got trauma on trauma on trauma, right. but like she's the client, she is in pain. He just wrecked the family. He just broke everything with her reality. So he is the villain right now, no matter whatever reasons for her, what he did. And so like she had to sit there and be like. She's like, I didn't correct the client. I sat with her and I listened to her. And she's just like so yeah. proud of herself because she wanted to fix that bias. It's like, why are you being harsh on him? And it's like, wait a minute. Right. Her, she's actually valid. Yeah. And so they able to kind of point that stuff out. And so I asked, like, you know, what clients are you mad at? Who are you struggling with? Why are we mad at them? Mm-hmm. Why are we afraid? I had somebody else go and do that. And they reflect back uh, they were mad at the PD. They were to realize why they were struggling with feeding was because of their own past trauma mm-hmm. and realizing that they're, she's mad at them because. They didn't help, like, she didn't get help, like, they're getting help now. Mm-hmm. And so she was able to kind of realize, that's why I'm mad at them, and then reframe it of, now I can help them. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't get that, so it was something let somebody else get what I didn't get. Mm-hmm. So what we're kind of talking about is trauma mastery, it sounds like. So mm-hmm. if, if, if you're noticing, I mean, we've all kind of been through this in our work, but also students are, you know, re- doing this for the first time, a lot of them. When they have a gut reaction like that, they have a very visceral kind of um, reaction to a, a client situation, asking them to slow down, think about what that could mean, what that connects to. I think what y'all will see, especially for you for you new, new field instructors, is that a lot of times students are kind of working through their own stuff, mm-hmm. um, which not saying that we all have to be like perfect at self-care or trauma mastery or, you know, all that good stuff. We're all kind of in process. But... Um, I think that's a really a really big thing that you're gonna you're gonna see, especially in mental health, is what can we do to encourage self reflection, mm-hmm. slowing down, reevaluating, um, and connecting mm-hmm. back to past trauma. And then if they need if they need resources, if they need their own counseling, I mean if they need counseling, UTA does have resources. We have a counseling center. Um, you know, but don't feel like you have to be their counselor. Okay. So <laughs> we had a question back here. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Makes it so much easier. So what what we're what we're hearing is. Think about a list of tasks first that you're expecting from your intern and then figure out which competencies they yeah. plug into. Mm-hmm. And again, you can double them for multiple competencies. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. The thing I've heard a lot, especially the advanced students, mm-hmm. is don't waste time doing a lot of case management. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hello? <laughs> a lot of our mental health clients mm-hmm. come in with lots of disruption. In your environment, mm-hmm. the basic needs are not being met. You can't spread a lot of accounts away from the relationship emotion. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm
you know, counseling, uh, counseling um, tools or, or process process through um, complex trauma if um, they're, you know, yeah, they have nowhere to sleep or whatever, whatever it is. So case management 101 is going to be um, an important thing for really for that to expect for students to, to have under their belt. Okay, just roll in. Yes. Yeah, cool. All right. Do we yeah. want to come with Okay. Questions. So more to come on learning contracts. We know that it's kind of a nebulous process, but do your best. Mm -hmm. Let us know what questions you have. Also, talk to your student's professor. If this is your first time doing it and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, yeah. ask them. Yeah. yeah, we'll send examples. We'll have some online. What questions do you have in general? feedback. Yes. I'm just curious where you all are at these days with enrollment. Mm. <laughs> 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 Too many. Natalie, come here. So the question was, how are we doing on enrollment numbers? <laughs> so I wish I could actually remember the breakdown. We just said it recently and I forgot. But the bachelor's, of course, is always a little bit lower. But overall, with bachelor's and master's, I mean, we have a little over 2,000 students enrolled um, in our program. So um, of course, eventually, all of those come through field because <laughs> everyone has to do that. Just recently. Y'all may have heard this, the, we have a lot of cohorts set up within our master's program, so that's basically that they can pick to go through the program through a year or for two years, and so that they basically take the exact same classes each semester. Um, so the way they're set up now, a lot of cohorts start in the fall, um, so typically a foundation student and even advanced students, they usually do their field placement in the second semester. So the way that's working now is spring semester is gigantic for us. Just this past semester, we had almost 700 students start a field placement. So if we are begging for spring and we're like, please take more, just anticipate in spring, you're going to get lots of emails like, please take another student. Um, it's insane. I don't think we're ever going to be able to try to change that, so we're just learning how to adapt to that. Yeah. But, but yeah, we have a little over 2,000 total bachelors and masters. It's a lot bigger than when I went through here several so several years ago. Years but, <laughs> but it's growing, growing. It's an LCDC perspective. So it's a whole separate learning contract. Sorry. I don't know. I think she'll, it's since it's online. Yeah. Did you all hear that? <laughs> yeah. Since it's a whole, it's its whole separate degree. The the BSUT program, um, since they only are required to have an LCDC, it you know if they don't have a social work degree, it's preferred, but it's not required. So with that, they have its own separate degree requirements, so separate learning contracts. So yes, LCDC perspective and approach for that. Yes. It's okay. Project. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm a disruptor. So <laughs> I am saying this as a social worker first and a state employee second. What does your gut say? What does your ethics say? Okay, so this is an opportunity for us to educate students about what is going on live right now with our legislature and what that does to populations that we serve. So 
And that's the hard thing is that, I mean, there's there's some NASW um, Texas uh, webinars going on right now. I don't know if y'all y'all mm -hmm. are, are members or, or get the emails, but um, the director of NASW Texas, Will Francis, he recently sent something out saying, we're going to do another webinar about mm -hmm. how to deal with this exact mm -hmm. thing because now we're dealing with criminal criminalization of some of our essential core values of social work. So I would say, um, you know, y'all are not employees of UTA, but you're kind of adjunct professors, sort of, unpaid, sorry. Um, but um, but first and foremost, you're, you're a social worker. So I would say follow your, your gut, follow our code of ethics. Mm -hmm. Always go back to the code of ethics if a student has a question about that, and then, it, and then challenge them. Be like, what do you think from a social work perspective? What does this, what does this policy saying about the, the people that we serve. So I don't know if that's the, the answer you were looking for, but um, that as far as like macro perspective, UTA position on that, um, I mean, that's yeah. way above our pay grade. Right. Uh, yeah. but, um, but we have heard, we are getting a new dean and the, the commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion is, is unchanging. Still in our school. Yeah. One hundred percent. We have to advocate for clients. There's no bending on that. So, great question. What else? Yes. I will answer that. Um, okay. So I know it's. Sometimes students will choose, oh, I can I could watch a documentary for and write a reflection for my hours. I do have a, a, a PDF I'll send to y'all um, of virtual activities that I've created for that purpose. Okay, the purpose of creating that was for students who maybe got started late mm -hmm. for whatever reason and they needed to catch up on hours. Um, these are virtual activities that students can do if at any point, you know, maybe they had to take some sick days and they, they got behind on hours. So they needed some uh, alternative activities they could do at home, such as watching a few uh, Netflix documentaries that I, I put on a list and said, you know, pretend you're the social worker and analyze it from this perspective. Um, but definitely we don't want them just sitting around watching Netflix for all their hours. So there is a limit. So what I tell students is you need a massive majority of your hours from field, from your actual internship. And if you choose to do any of these like virtual activities, we have online trainings like CEU stuff. Um, we have, they can do a policy analysis, they can do a windshield survey, which is like a community survey from your car. Um, all kinds of activities like that they can do on their own, but they must get approval from their field instructor in order to count those hours. Um, so yeah, if your student's just trying to <laughs> read a bunch of books and watch a bunch of Netflix, okay, that's cool, but it's not going to supplement your hours. So that's kind of what we created in lieu of, because we know there's a lot of, yeah, we had the COVID initiative, we had a lot of creating of activities to make sure that students had enough hours. But does that answer your question? Does that help? They yeah, need approval. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I would that's say generally, I mean, if you tell a student, we really don't want them doing more than like, I mean, preferably not more than like 10% of their hours to be virtual stuff. You should probably stretch it to maybe 20%, depending on what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the first option is always, are they able to do hours at the location? If they're able to do hours for your agency, mm -hmm. that's what that's they first. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can't just say, oh, well, I'll do something else. No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. as the field instructor, y'all are approving yeah. their hours first. Yeah. So it is your call whether or not you want to approve that. Um, that's why it's important, I think, to go through go through your time logs every week and you know see what the student's doing. Go if they're trying to supervision and that's go through a it during supervision. Yeah, that catching well, we can absolutely that. write that as yeah. the policy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that is because we're hearing this last couple of semesters mm -hmm. with this transition. I know a lot of students are yeah, or <laughs> well, my friend from two years ago got to do this. So I think that is something I think we need to write that as a policy. Yeah, yeah. and we'll to make sure every student knows and let y'all know. Dr. J. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a policy uh, with any of our placements. Um, and they can only have 10 the first part of the semester after midterm, and all of them have to be towards their practice. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. They can't just do any kind of training, right? Uh, or whatever, and then write something up. It has to be something that they are interested in, and then Absolutely. And for advanced, I mean, for whatever their specialty is, yeah. if you're approving any kind of virtual thing for them, make sure that it, it's applicable to their specialty um, or the certain population that you're serving. So it, it has to relate. Yeah. Yes, it's 10, it's 10 uh, the first eight weeks and then 10 the other eight weeks. Um, but they cannot be, all of those 10 cannot be in that one. Okay, so, they have to spread so excellent. So if y'all want to do something like that, yep. come up with a plan like that. So Maybe. we're going to tighten up the screws on our policies around <laughs> yeah. that. And However, again, again, approving the hours is up to you. Yeah. So that like you're the first line of approval for the student, and then it goes to the professor, to, and then they, they um, approve the hours. Yes. Uh, so I've got a lot of people who can only come on the weekends in mm -hmm. summer, and so... Yay. So I've had time <laughs> with them. For us, we need our resources revamped of the Lincoln Center the community, so I'm going to give them research projects of like, however many of go, like, here's two resources, verify the criteria, yeah. how we choose more. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the community what's needed, but I'm trying to figure out like, how do I count, like, what they do, like, per resource, like, how do I, like, like this to take about this many hours, mm -hmm. or that's 10 hours, that's one resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a page from Dallas County Probate Court. Do y'all know them? Are mm -hmm. y'all familiar? All right, so um, what they do is like for every case that they send students to go to their, uh, they do home visits for people who, who are incapacitated and need guardianship. Um, so for every case, it's just a standard four hours, even if it only took an hour or eight hours. It's just, it's just kind of their method of kind of standardizing. You get four hours of credit for every case. So, I mean, Sometimes you kind of have to put parameters like that if your work is a little bit gray, but um, just do the best you can. Um, as long as you and your student have, again, have a good working relationship, you have mutual trust, um, you know they're not trying to just earn hours just to get by. I mean, it's going to be pretty clear if like they're lying or they're, you know, just trying to gain hours. Just remind them why they're here. You're here to learn, so I'm going to give you a task that will help you learn, and your hours should reflect that. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so this new contract that we signed is definitely a new partnership, and I want to make sure that this master's uh, level um, student gets that quality graduate experience, right, with this new program. So um, I think one of that probably should take the kids to come from a CAP program mm -hmm. for us. Um, is there... <laughs> CAP, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know nursing, that, that's my specialty, but now since the person who is signing off on the MSS is not the person that is going to be engaging with full time. So is there some type of like model mentorship I can connect with someone? Because I want to make sure that the student is getting quality experience mm. and getting that money worth. <laughs> uh, I want it to be valuable and not, because they're not in nursing school. You know, they're in a social work program, so I want to make sure that we're spotting. Mm. So is, it would be you probably wanted to connect with? Or? Yeah, sure. okay. I was about to say, we could sure. probably think of Oh, sorry. We could probably think of a couple of places that have had a lot of experience with CAP students, so maybe get you in contact with them, so we can kind of. I'm yeah. looking directly at Diana Jones right now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 JK. Yeah. You know what, y'all? <laughs> but how awesome that, like, y'all look at this community right yeah. here. We have, we have a community of field instructors, experienced social workers, passionate about uh, future social work education. I think that's a great idea. Forming, you know, partnerships, mentorships, linking to each other. It's a great idea. I will, um, yes. Yes. Happy hour. Yes. Social work, social hour. Okay. Done. <laughs> so starts today. <laughs> Meet me at the bar. Idea. We'll start sending out invites soon to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I love that. Thank you. So y'all know we have what we call power hours for students. It's like an hour of power. It's an hour <laughs> an hour uh, where students can like drop in. It's like our office hours with advisors. We could do that for, for y'all. We'd love yeah, to do that. Yeah, we could maybe do something like that. Yeah. Like yeah.
fostering community. Oh, yeah. Yep. Field. Okay. We need to go yeah. tour the building, but yeah. we are here for questions. If you have anything, you have our emails, I think. Yeah. They're on the screen. Oh, y'all please take bagels. <laughs> take a box. Like, take the whole box. <laughs> If you're going to do the tour, um, give us a couple minutes. We're going to gather our stuff, and then y'all can follow us over there. Also, um, later today, I think, Amanda and Chris are going to start sending out emails to everyone that has RSVP that we know. You're going to get um, a copy of the recording. You're going to get a copy of the PowerPoint, um, the insight guide. I'm trying to think. I know there's some other things. A lot of things. Happy oh, yeah. invite. If you yeah. want to be used for this, we are able to offer 2.5 CDUs. So, yes. we'll send a survey out. We, yes. yeah. we'll send the survey out also. If you want to see you, just fill it out, submit it. If the and Amanda will take care of it. You <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank yes, we you guys are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and we get them too, right? We can, yeah, cool. Do we have to? Do, I mean, we've got, I've gotten them before. For, Okay, cool. I need to sign. We need to, I'll just let Chris know. Send me that. <laughs> Yay, guys. Are we all going on the tour? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I need to go. Oh, awesome. Uh, I, st I actually, we've been working from home for the most part, but I started in Arlington, overseas in Arlington. I'm the chief parking officer for really good parking space. Great. Thank you for your question. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we're well, really we are. Good. Yeah. Well, I just feel for you. I just, uh, you think that you have a good well, it was, you know, we did this when they came in with the uh, okay, okay, cool. camera or whatever, it's on that, you know, one thing.